Catherine of Aragon was born on the 16th of December 1485 at the Archiepiscopal Palace of Alcala de Henares in Castile. She was christened Catalina and she was the fifth surviving child of Isabella of Castile and her husband Ferdinand of Aragon. Her parents were dubbed the Catholic Kings by Pope Alexander the sixth in 1496, grateful as he was for their crusading efforts and defense of the Catholic faith. Catherine's mother, Isabella, was a hands-on mother. The children even accompanying her on crusade. She took a direct interest in their education and the girls, Isabella, Juana, Maria, and Catherine had almost as good an education as their brother Juan. But there were some interesting gaps in that education. They spoke Latin and Spanish, but other foreign languages, including English, which would become important for Catherine, were not included. In the spring of 1489, an English delegation arrived to negotiate a treaty of alliance between England and Spain. The treaty would be sealed with the betrothal of the three-year-old Catherine to the two-year-old Arthur Tudor, eldest son and heir to Henry VII of England. As part of the negotiations, the financial treaty of the marriage was sorted. Catherine's parents were to send a marriage portion, 200,000 crowns payable in two instalments. And Henry VII, in return, would bestow one third of the lands of the Prince of Wales on Catherine to create a dower for her or an income should Arthur die. The English wanted the three-year-old Catherine to go to England immediately. The Spanish prevaricated for over a decade. Initially, this was probably because Ferdinand, a competent negotiator, was hedging his bets in case of a better offer. But later on, it was more of an emotional decision by Isabella at least, who by this time had suffered the loss of her son, Juan, in 1497, whose wife, Margaret of Austria, had then given birth to a stillborn baby. She'd lost her daughter, Isabella, who died in 1498, and Isabella's son, Miguel. With her other sisters married, Catherine was the only one left at home, and Isabella did not want to let her go. Catherine finally arrived in England at 3pm on the 2nd of October 1501. She landed at Plymouth. Isabella had requested Southampton as she had heard that it was the safest harbour in England, but bad weather had overruled even Isabella and Catherine landed at Plymouth, where she was well received by the people with an immediate affection which endured for her entire life and beyond. On the 14th of November, Catherine and Arthur were married at St Paul's Cathedral. This was the first public wedding in living memory and the crowds rejoiced. Catherine was escorted down the aisle by the younger brother of her bridegroom. He was the 10 year old Henry, Duke of York. The couple wore white satin with gold embellishments, pearls and precious stones. The young royal couple were a beacon of hope for a country that had been ravaged by civil war for so long. Now the people could look forward to a steady future. They knew who their next king was going to be and now he had married a beautiful Spanish princess. Heirs were surely to follow. And no one appeared to have any doubts that this young, healthy couple would consummate their marriage. After more days of celebrations and jousts, including a blessing back at St Paul's Cathedral two days later, on the 4th of December, the new Prince and Princess of Wales prepared to leave London for their marital home and Arthur's seat as Prince of Wales and head of the Council of the Marches, Ludlow Castle. 
Only a few months later, the couple both came down with the sweating sickness. Both were extremely ill, but Catherine made a good recovery. However, within five months of the marriage, Arthur had died. Catherine was now a widower in a foreign country and unfortunately, despite all those negotiations over such a long period prior to their wedding, there had been no contingency agreed for if Arthur should die so prematurely into the marriage. Only half of Catherine's marriage portion had been paid. That had been paid at the wedding and so Henry VII didn't see any reason to fulfil his side of the bargain either, and the third of the Prince of Wales' lands which should have been bestowed on Catherine were not granted to her. Negotiations began again, Henry VII having the upper hand by having control of Catherine's person. Arthur was buried at Worcester Cathedral, and Catherine was brought back to London in short stages, the court thinking perhaps that she was pregnant. The assumption still being that the marriage had been consummated. Of course, this wouldn't become an issue until decades later when Henry VIII was trying to annul his marriage to Catherine. But of course, all of that was in Catherine's future. She had much more immediate concerns. As she returned to London, she must have wondered what would become of her. Indeed, the next few years were very difficult for Catherine as she was a pawn in negotiations once again between her father and her father-in-law. Marriage negotiations began again. This time, Henry VII put forward his second son, Henry Duke of York. But there was still the contentious issue of the fact that the second half of the marriage portion had still not been paid by Spain. These negotiations, though, in a way, did create opportunity for Catherine. She effectively became the Spanish ambassador to the English court. It helped her learn English, which we know was missed from her own education back in Spain. And her personal skills as a negotiator meant that she became a fixture for the household during negotiations regarding her dowry and the marriage portion. Still though, Catherine was just a pawn in the negotiations and these would continue right up until the death of her father-in-law. When Henry VII died on the 21st of April 1509, his death was kept secret. This was to facilitate a smooth transfer of power to the new regime under his son and heir, now Henry VIII. Ministers close to Henry VII were used as scapegoats for Henry's unpopular policies, which were immediately overturned. The new king, Henry VIII, was 18 years old and wanted to stamp his authority on the throne. One of his first decisions as an independent king was to get married. And his choice of bride was his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon. They were married on the 11th of June of the same year in a private ceremony, in contrast to that grand ceremony at St Paul's Cathedral that Catherine had enjoyed at her wedding to Arthur. The marriage portion, so contentious, had now been paid in full by the Spanish, so the 18-year-old Henry married the 24-year-old Catherine. There are a few reasons put forward as to why he'd made this decision so early on in his reign. One was that he still wanted the alliance with Catherine's father, Ferdinand of Aragon. That he was mature enough, which a married man's status would have purveyed. But also, above everything, it appears that he married Catherine because... He wanted to. The ceremony was small and private, perhaps because this was Catherine's second marriage and the first being to the groom's brother, but also there was about to be a much bigger event. Of course, 
the coronation, which was planned for Midsummer's Day, the 24th of June, where both Henry and Anne would be crowned and anointed as God's chosen King and Queen. Catherine, as much the Queen of England in God's eyes, as Henry was King. The couple had a protracted honeymoon, during which Catherine fell pregnant. Henry was delighted. But on the 31st of January 1510, Catherine gave birth to a stillborn daughter. Tragically, she was told that this girl had been one of a set of twins and that Catherine's belly which continued to be swollen, was swollen because she was still pregnant. This ended with the Queen going into confinement as if she was pregnant in the June. But her periods had begun again and there were many around her convinced that she could surely not be pregnant. Unfortunately, that was the case. And when no baby arrived, Catherine felt the humiliation and Henry felt anger. He had also, during the lengthy confinement of Catherine, taken a mistress. This was the first time that the couple publicly argued. Catherine wrote to her father Ferdinand of Aragon to tell him that she had given birth to a stillborn girl. However, she didn't tell him about the false second pregnancy but as she wrote to him Catherine was once again pregnant Henry and Catherine must have slept together up until her confinement this time a baby was born live and it was a boy he was christened Prince Henry he was born on the 1st of January 1511 and the country and the king and of course Catherine rejoiced. There were huge celebrations. Henry's decision to marry Catherine had been vindicated but tragically the baby lived for only 52 days dying on the 22nd of February. There's no recorded cause of death so we're not sure why the baby died but Catherine was beside herself with grief. Henry apparently put on a brave face in order to support his wife. Things may not have been going well for Catherine in terms of siring Henry an heir, but Henry had certainly not lost faith in Catherine as an able wife. And when he went off to fight the French in 1513, he left Catherine as regent. This wasn't a nominal position, her signature was required on documents, she was able to make episcopal appointments and, as it turned out, lead an army herself. For it was while Henry was in France that the Scottish King, James IV, decided to invade the north of England. This resulted in the famous Battle of Flodden, at which James IV was killed. However, had his army been able to win that battle and come further down south into England, he would have met with two more arm armies, one of which we think was headed up by Catherine herself, for there are receipts for armour fit for the Queen. Catherine's behaviour during this time seems to have been widely commented on, with admiration. An Italian living in London wrote to his brother informing him that they not only had a magnanimous king but also our queen had taken to the field. An imitation of her famous warrior queen mother Isabella. Catherine's letter to Henry at this time where he is still in France is really quite telling. She starts the letter sir and then calls him my husband and my Henry. And she is exultant. She is so excited to tell him of the victory against the Scots, being careful to, of course, 
congratulate Henry on his own victory over in France. Catherine must have felt on a high. Not only had she ran the country and led a defeat of the Scots once and for all in Henry's absence, but she was once again pregnant. However, this pregnancy, there is no record of how it ended, so it is assumed that she miscarried sometime around September. There was another stillbirth in late 1514, followed by the birth of Mary in February 1516, and then another daughter on the 10th of November 1518. Mary, of course, being the sole surviving child of Catherine and Henry. Over time, Henry became convinced that his marriage was cursed and that their lack of sons was an indication of God's displeasure. The Pope, he assumed, had been wrong. The dispensation to allow him to marry his brother's widow had been given in error. The crux of the matter at the divorce proceedings came down to was the marriage between Arthur and Catherine consummated? Catherine argued vehemently that she had been a virgin when she had married Henry. However, her defence didn't hold water with Henry, who was convinced that his version was correct. He even found a passage in the Bible which clearly stated the truth as he saw it. Leviticus stated, And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness, they shall be childless. Now, of course, they weren't completely childless at all. They had a daughter, Mary. However, Henry wanted a son. This was a fledgling dynasty. His father had secured it. He had had two sons, the heir and Henry himself, who was the spare. But he had created no living male heir to secure the Tudor throne. Henry's mind was set. He wanted the marriage wiped out. He wanted it annulled. The Pope, however, Catholic Europe and Catherine herself did not accept his argument. In July 1530, the divorce petition to the Pope was sent from London. It took two months to get to Rome it was an attempt with a thinly veiled threat for Pope Clement VII to see the situation from Henry's point of view. Alas, Pope Clement VII had bigger issues on his mind for only three years earlier he had been humiliated at the hands of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor and nephew of Catherine of Aragon. Rome had been sacked by the Empress forces and although not at the Emperor's direct orders, the Pope was not likely to side against a man whose armies had already shown themselves willing and able to carry out such a ferocious attack on his city. What the Pope could not have anticipated was that Henry would break from Rome conclusively, creating the church in England with him as the supreme head. This did allow Henry control now over his great matter. His marriage to Catherine was officially annulled by the newly appointed Archbishop Cranmer on the 28th of May 1533. Cranmer's part in the divorce of Catherine and Henry would see him burnt at the stake under the reign of her daughter, Mary I. Catherine herself refused to use the reinstated title of Dowager Princess of Wales in re recognition of her marriage to Henry's older brother Arthur, referring to herself as the Queen of England until her death. In 1531, Catherine left court. 
Her successor, Anne Boleyn, moved into the Queen's apartments at court. Catherine lived in a number of houses away from court until moving to the place she would never leave, Kimbolton Castle, in May 1534, where she appears to have confined herself to one room, leaving only to attend Mass. She wore a hair shirt and fasted often. Did that, perhaps, contribute to her premature death at the age of only 50 years old and only five years after her forced retreat from court? The ultimate cruelty for this hands-on mother was that she had been forbidden to see or communicate with her only living child, her daughter, Mary. In late December 1535, Catherine, possibly sensing that her health was failing, made her will and wrote a series of letters. One was to her nephew, Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, asking him to protect her daughter, Mary. Another was to Henry, who she addressed as my most dear lord and husband. In the letter, she claims concern for his soul and that she forgives him and will continue to pray to God for his forgiveness for Henry too. She pleaded with him to be a good father to their daughter and also asks him to make sure that her servants are well looked after. She finishes by saying that her eyes desire you above all things and she signs off Catherine the Queen. Catherine died at Kimbolton Castle on the 7th of January 1536. When news reached the court the following day, it was received with great rejoicing. Spanish ambassador Eustace Shapri reported with understandable distaste, you could not conceive the joy that this king and those who favour the concubinage have shown at Catherine's death. The concubinage, of course, being those who supported the Anne Boleyn marriage. The people rejoicing included Anne Boleyn herself, but it was very soon clear to her that with Catherine gone, her own position, far from being strengthened, was far more tenuous. For with Catherine alive, Henry couldn't have been seen to be getting rid of another wife. Unfortunately for Anne, her intuition had been correct. And on the date of Catherine's funeral, the 29th of January 1536, Anne miscarried. Within four months, she would be dead as well. Catherine was buried at Peterborough Abbey, now Peterborough Cathedral. The location was chosen by Henry VIII, who also ordered that she should be buried in line with her position as Dowager Princess of Wales. There was a state procession with many noble ladies dressed in black. Chief mourner was Eleanor Brandon, Countess of Cumberland, daughter of Charles Brandon and the King's late sister, Mary Tudor. Catherine's body had been embalmed, wrapped in linen, encased in lead and placed in a coffin. For the service, the coffin was placed at the lowest step of the high altar, surrounded by 1,000 candles, while 600 women, dressed in black, prayed for Catherine. Banners relating to all the great houses to which she was related, including Spain, Aragon, Sicily, Portugal and the Holy Roman Empire, hung around. There were also banners including the badges of her first husband, Arthur, Prince of Wales, and of her own pomegranate. The service was taken by John Hilsey, Bishop of Rochester. He was a loyal supporter of Henry VIII and used the ceremony to attack the Pope and affirm that Catherine and Henry had never been married. He went so far as to tell a blatant lie that on her deathbed, Catherine had acknowledged that she had never been Queen of England but as we have seen from her final letter to Henry, even to him, she stubbornly continued to refer to herself as Catherine the Queen. You can still visit Catherine's final resting place at Peterborough Cathedral. And each year, on the weekend closest to her burial date of the 29th of January, they hold a festival in remembrance of Catherine. And so we will remember Catherine now as I close off this episode of British History with myself, Philippa, and thank you for watching.